The Aldergate Papers An Introduction Hello, strange world. My name is Adrian Ward, but beyond that, things get a bit complicated. This much I can say with confidence, that I am a student of the unknown, an enthusiast of the unusual, a beloved outcast, an obscure celebrity, a penniless billionaire, a reformed Harris Mundi, a human parasite, a partial amnesiac, and I am the 51st Vice-Chancellor of Aldergate University. <laughs> At one point I seemed to be perfectly on track to live fast and die young, but I must have been living not quite fast enough, because when the crack-up came I survived it, more or less. <laughs> Bad little Adrian sat on a wall, slipped, or was pushed, either way had a fall. Now all the king's horses are wondering whether enough of him's left to be put back together. <sighs> Hard to say. For the past few years I've been a total invalid, and more than once I've come within an ace of losing my grip on this mortal coil. However, against whatever odds, it does seem, lately, that I may be getting better. Not quickly, and there's no telling whether I can or should hope for anything like a full recovery. However, I am enough myself again to feel a sense of duty. I have a job to do. <sighs> Trouble is, I'm not entirely certain what that job is, let alone how to do it. My only hope of working that out requires that I go digging through the wreckage of myself to see if there's anything worth saving. <laughs> The worst part of losing one's marbles is having to crawl about under the furniture looking for them. However, to aid in that task I have one great asset. My diary. A journal that I kept throughout that last messy chapter of my former life. Just the thing, one might think, for a fellow hoping to pick up the pieces and resume where he left off. And so it would be if not for the inconvenient and frankly silly fact that I simply can't stand the idea of reading it. <sighs> that is where you come in. It seems I've got to do this thing, but I'm not doing it alone. And there's something else as well. You may have noticed that the world has been behaving a bit, well, strangely as of late. I think that I can, perhaps, provide a bit of an explanation. I may, in fact, bear some measure of responsibility. I'm not sure. If so, and if there's any truth in the odd fragments of memory that I just can't seem to shake, well, there are things you deserve to know. Things that may help you to understand what's going on, and what's coming. So, thank you for your support. I must warn you in advance that, well, while I do try generally to be polite, pleasant company, and so on, I am not altogether what you might call a nice person. I cannot guarantee that this will be entirely a nice diary. All I can promise is that I shall be honest, as much as I know how to be. Whatever I may have buried in these pages... We will uncover it together. <sighs> I am profoundly uncomfortable about this whole idea. But I am resolved. So, here goes everything.
Ah, one quick note. Of course, it's unfair to expect anyone to parachute into a stranger's life and understand exactly what's going on. I may, therefore, need to give you a few footnotes from time to time as we go along. To that end, I have stolen a pair of my host's silver teaspoons, with which I shall indicate these parenthetical comments. Like so. Well, then, I suppose I had better begin at the beginning. Where we stop? Well, that all depends. However, the notebook in which I started this journal has got a quotation printed in it at the top of the first page. I think I shall start with that epigraph, because I'm rather fond of it. Even now. Yes. Yes. Anyhow, let us begin. The Aldergate Papers Epigraph Our most essential task, I think, is to correlate all the contents of human minds. Once upon a time we knew nothing and understood it all. Now we know so very much that the most brilliant brain cannot hope to comprehend even a single piece of the great jigsaw puzzle in its entirety. And yet, our goal, the end and aim of our efforts, must be to fit all the pieces together. We seek that revelation which has always been accessible to our sight, but never to our understanding. What shall we learn upon that day when at last we look upon our universe with educated eyes, and, observing nothing new, see it all for the first time? Sir Adrian Ward, KBE, Scholar of Aldergate University It is the first day of the return to Aldergate. The time and place of writing is just after eleven o'clock at night in the Arkwell Privy Library, atop the manse of the Vice-Chancellor. We begin. Well then, self old boy. Here's a fine start to your latest adventure. This little experiment in time travel has spun quite out of your control. You only meant to step back a decade and a half, but here you are in the Dark Ages. If this moldy pile loses power every time there's a bit of rain, it looks like hard times for you at Aldergate. Back when you were at school here, it could rain for weeks on end. <sighs> ah, well. No use sulking. You've got a lovely fire going, rugged indoorsman that you are. Still a bit damp, but you can feel your nose and fingers again. Hypothermia shall not claim the life of Adrian Ward. <sighs> No, that duty and pleasure will fall to your old friends, once they make up their minds to do it. Although you've nearly cheated them twice this week already. First you come within an ace of drowning, and if your reflexes were any less cat-like, you'd have broken your neck just now. That would have been unkind of you, after all the trouble you've caused, to go smashing a head that's so highly in demand. Hmm. Well, if the bastards want you, they'll have to get a move on. At this rate, you'll be struck by lightning or eaten by ghosts before the night's out. Do ghosts eat people? 
Well, oh, soon see. Look at this old place. Must be crawling with ancestral spirits. Not your ancestors, of course. Well, I suppose they might be, actually. They're your spirits now, at any rate. <sighs> yes, it's all yours now. All of Aldergate. Thirty colleges. Forty-odd billion pounds sterling in endowment funds. Nine centuries of tumultuous history. And one unsolved murder. All for little old Adrian. You are the ruler of all that you see. Which isn't much at the moment. Hmm. And it's the things you can't see you've got to worry about. Yes. Also wrist cramp. Whoever the maniac was who invented this notion of writing out words by hand, you curse his name and hope he chokes. Perhaps you can get Baz to find you a laptop. Something safely second-hand and institutionally anonymous. That ought to be all right, surely, as long as you stay offline. And never take it out in public. <sighs> and encase it in lead, and only operate it inside a Faraday cage whilst wearing dark glasses and a false moustache. <sighs> no, alas. No mucking about, not this time. You're in the spotlight now, under the microscope. All eyes on Adrian. Can't get careless. If you must incriminate yourself, and it seems unavoidable that you must, best to do it in hard copy. No such thing as digital security these days, and nobody more to blame for that than your own miserable self. Self. So, tally-ho for the ink and paper. Inconvenient, but it's not really so bad. And think how romantic it all is, all alone in this magnificent library, swaddled in your stolen robe and propped up in this grand old wingback chair. Not a sound but the crackling of the logs on the hearth, the scratch of your pen, and a fine November thunderstorm pelting away outside. Well, mostly outside. You really ought to just tear out these first few soggy sheets before you chew right through them. But how often does a chap get to start his journal on a page that's got his own quotation printed at the top? <laughs> Is that vanity, self, old boy? The towering ego of the clockwork butcher? Well, that's hardly the worst they'll call you if this all goes tits up. Oh, ah, yes. Speaking of which, you'd best shake hands with Mr. Deadman before you forget. There now. Oh, and forget ye not to plug Sibling in once the power's back. It's been a few days, and she's getting thirsty. No rush. Don't put yourself out. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> hmm. How's that for eschatological humor? Scene. Adrian Ward, wild-eyed, dashing from door to door, begging for electricity and ranting about the downfall of civilization. And to think, you're working so hard to convince them all that you're not actually a lunatic. Hmm. <sighs> Perhaps this journal's a bad idea after all. Dash it, though. You've got to. The idea of leaving your private thoughts just lying around on paper gives you an awful plummeting sensation. But what other choice is there? Someone's got to keep an eye on you, and at this point you're the only one you can trust to do it. Yes, because you're so very trustworthy. Still, better to light a candle than curse the darkness. 
though you've done plenty of both already this evening. And better to back up your memory in dead tree format than to rely on the time bomb ticking away between your ears. Well, then. From the top, once more with feeling. Dear Diary, Starting to dry out a bit. You're feeling quite lovely and toasty, in fact. The manse of the Vice-Chancellor may have its faults, electrical and otherwise, but the place does know fireplaces. In fact, you may have overdone things a trifle. Do you detect the smell of roasting carpet slippers? Ah, well. Extremism in the pursuit of coziness is no vice, and when a chap can barely hear over the chattering of his teeth, he stacks logs first and asks questions afterwards. Getting him lit was another matter. Sir Reggie has left great heaps of these dismal student petition forms on the reading table, and you were strongly considering using them for kindling. That would have been a pretty first act as VC, burning the hopes and dreams of your students. Luckily, when you went digging into the heap, you found a quart of Ronson fuel buried underneath. Also, half a set of ivory chessmen a paper knife of eastern design, and a toy wind-up octopus that became awfully lively when you turned its key. Oh, good old Sir Reggie. For all his faults, you never caught him unprepared. He has left you one twist of a mess to clean up. Oh. What are these petition things, anyhow? New since your time. And since when does an altercation ask, need, or want approval for anything? Got to be Baz's idea. She always did think that the university could stand to have a bit of order imposed on it. <laughs> Wild horses, Baz. Wild horses. I'm surprised Sir Reggie even allowed the things in the house. Never much fancied paperwork, did your illustrious predecessor. If you want something, very well come and ask me for it, so I can tell you to shut off. <laughs> Will that be your policy as well? You really must start thinking like a VC. What to do with these petitions? To say nothing of those that may come in future. Up in smoke? Or will you rescue these poor hopefuls from library litter limbo? Let's have a look. <sighs> Scholar's petition for permission, dispensation, and endowment. Uh, here's one from S. Almadi of Delora College. Hmm. Requesting funds and dedicated practice venue for the development of a new martial art. Hmm. Advanced virtual models of human anatomy, employing improvised weaponry of the present era, headphone cord, laptop, etc. Huh. Here's one from um, B. Wells of Pell Parvis, uh, seeking human subjects for cosmetic transspecies tissue grafting. Lovely. Here's L. Bryony of Bester College. Seeks transportation, lodgings, per diem, etc. to send the old river rippers to the All Europe Flat Track Roller Derby Invitational. In July of last year. Well, I hope they made it, anyhow. Probably did. It's not in the altercation character to let a dream get snagged on the barbs of administrative inertia. Sir Reggie probably had the right idea. Poor Baz, it'll bruise her tidy little soul, but you'll make it up to her. Somehow. Eventually. Assuming you survive the night, it'll be a close-run thing. You've nowhere left to retreat to now. 
This patch of firelight is your last redoubt. Here you must make your stand. Your supply lines are cut off. You dropped most of your things on the first landing when the power went, and you're not going down there again, not in the dark. You're just lucky you remember where the kitchen is, and that your phone battery lasted long enough to help you find Sir Reggie's stash of candles in the cupboard. Poor old fellow must have endured his own share of blackouts here, when he could be bothered to stop in for a cuppa between expeditions. Too bad he took the matches with him when he disappeared. You've had to make do with the gas stove in the kitchen for candle lighting, and your phone gave its final death rattle before you managed to get one of the drippy things to light. That was a moment. You don't properly appreciate the noisiness of a well-lit life until you're suddenly alone in the dark, with nothing but your little ring of blue gas flame and the roaring silence of whatever's coming up behind you. <sighs> well, it cost you a broiled knuckle, but you got the job done. Candle held high, you made it back to base camp, snagged your satchel, and began the climb. Three flights of ancient stairs up to the library, under the painted gaze of your fifty forebears. Ah. Diarist's note. That's fifty forebears, not fifty forebears. I am not the prophet Elisha. Yes, fifty other distinguished persons have held the title of Vice-Chancellor of the University of Aldergate, and they've got the portraits to prove it. Anyhow, yes, I went back upstairs and... Ahem, settled in for the serious business of plotting out your future. Thoughtful, manipulative old Baz stuck this Aldergate University souvenir notebook and a couple of Aldergate University souvenir biros in the nostalgia-laden welcome package she brought when she came to inveigle you into this job. So at least you were armed for the task. In fact, you were just working yourself into the spirit of this diary business, this orgy of atavism. You raised your pen, wishing it were a quill, and you yourself some venerably moth-eaten scholar from an earlier page in Aldergate's history. And then the window blew open. Rain, forsooth. There might have been a chap outside flinging in ice water by the bucketful, and only you present to deal with it. Hmm. Upon reflection, there's probably a pole with a hook on it or something. But you didn't think of that at the time, and you'd never have found it if you had. The manse library has got one of those roly ladders, or at least it had fifteen years ago. But if it's still here, it's buried somewhere in the sagging mountain of cardboard boxes with which Sir Reggie has thoughtfully clogged up the place. In the end, you had to climb up a tallish set of shelves. And then you had to climb it all over again, after your encounter with that beastly great owl that peered in at you suddenly when you reached the top. Nearly saved your old pals the trouble, and it's a marvel you didn't at least fracture something. Anyhow, the awful white-faced thing had gone by the time you regained the summit. Lucky for it. Words would have been had. <sighs> By the time you got the window closed and fastened again, you were soaked to the skin, and, of course, your candle had long since died of heart failure. <sighs> so you did what had to be done. The Scarbell one-button houndstooth is lovely for sleeping in on long plane rides, and you rather fancy yourself in grey flannel, but it takes on water like a sponge, and then clingeth closer than a brother. So you peeled off your wet things and staggered kitchenwards again. In the dark, naturally, and muttering darkly au naturel. You had to stick to the walls or lose yourself entirely, and twist if this manse nuisance didn't grow tenfold just to be difficult. It took fully five minutes of fumbling just to find the stairs, working your way back through the library along Sir Reggie's cardboard box rampart. 
Add another week spent picking your way down the first flight in the pitch black, then another year and a quarter spent lingering on the landing, listening to that distant tapping noise that it seems you're going to be living with now. You deranged a dozen portraits and groped a throned statue of Sibel on your way down, not to mention crushing a toe or two on your own bloody suitcases. Then, just when you thought you'd made it to the kitchen, you got hold of the wrong door and found the basement. Cue a Warner Brothers moment of wondering where the floor had got to, and then you were off down yet more stairs, arse over tea kettle. Again you escaped injury. Fortune smiles on drunks and fools. But you landed in something wet, put your hand into something vile, and finished by crawling back up, every inch the dashing visionary from your photo spread in Fortune magazine. <sighs> well, you found the kitchen again, and used your bare shins to smash up the furniture for a bit before you finally located the stove. So, there's a start to your new career, eh, self old man? Let it be a lesson in humility for you. Whatever you may accomplish in your time here at Aldergate, remember that you began your tenure blind, bruised, naked, shivering, and bloody furious. Respice post te, hominem te esse memento. Memento mori. Not that you need reminding. There's too much death about these days. <sighs> what you could use is a cup of coffee. Or three. It must be pushing midnight now, and you were up with the lark this morning. Do they have larks in Manhattan? Would you know a lark if you saw one? They're blue, aren't they? Or are you thinking of swallows? No, they're the ones with the tails that... Stop. Stop it. All right, look, you've never kept a diary before, so it's natural you're no good at it. But at this point, you're simply rambling. Let's get one thing clear, ab initio. This journal is for three things, and three things only. One, a record of events as a backup for your questionable memory. Two, a case file to track the state of your doubly questionable health. And three, a drafting board for this little scheme of yours. Yes, and the feathered fauna of Central Park play no part in any of these. Unless it turns out you've just been allergic to pigeons all this time. <laughs> that would be a thing, wouldn't it? And it's not entirely out of the question. Environmental triggers, they're called. Perhaps there's something in taxi exhaust that's been throwing your brain out of gear. <sighs> it's a happy thought, at least. You lost fifteen minutes on the ride to JFK this morning. Yes. Be precise now. These are case notes, after all. <sighs> all right, then. 5 a.m. Eastern Time. Wake up. Shower. Shave. Take final inventory. Suits, socks, skivvies, shoes, satchel, sibling. Toothpaste, toothbrush, toiletries. Face stuff, hair stuff, war paint. Refill tin of peppermints. Half dextroamphetamine, half peppermints. Envelope with shiny new passport. Moment of existential crisis upon realizing that you are, once again, somebody who uses a passport. Earbuds. 6.10 a.m. A fond farewell to floor 12 of the old AGB. 
You'll miss it. Tom the Usurper has hinted that they're in the market if you want to split the place back up into condos. Their flat is lovely, but it's a block and a half down, and they can't see the park unless they stand on their balcony and lean out over West 81st. You'll think about it. 6.15. Your chariot awaits. Into the car and away. Hmm. And then, blip. One moment you're gliding down the transverse, and then suddenly it's a quarter of an hour later and you're on East 79th. Not that it matters, but still stressful. Yes, stressful. You got that tightness in the back of your neck on FDR. And the moment you got onto the bridge, the trapped thing woke up and started banging about up front in the glove compartment. Ugh. Well, if this new gig has one thing going for it, it ought to at least dial down the old brain pressure. In theory. The way this evening's gone, it's amazing you haven't got a whole platoon of trapped things flailing wildly inside every one of Sir Reggie's bloody boxes. But no. So far, it's been all quiet on the figment front since you touched down in England. Perhaps that's a good sign. Perhaps you really have left a few of those loose screws behind you. They all came out for your send-off. You watched the musical egg slalom lazily betwixt the trees along the Van Wick and disappear into the clouds over Jamaica Bay. And you think you spied Mr. Jellyface loitering in Terminal 4. Not sure. At that point, you were too busy congratulating yourself on that citation-needed crack you'd inflicted on the fellow who'd come to escort you. Anyhow, you knew better than to look too closely. One walkabout in a morning's journey is quite enough, thanks. If it was your last, you will not be sorry. Hmm. Too much to hope for. But, well, so good so far. You've been present and correct ever since you slipped the surly bonds of earth and left the new world behind you. Well, you were unconscious for most of the flight, but that was deliberate. <laughs> Who'd be an actor? It really is exhausting being on stage. You could practically hear the jet groaning under the weight of the hidden microphones and covert cameras and things. You'd have had more privacy flying commercial. Chin up. Got to give a good show of being a good boy. So... Half a raspberry yogurt and a supreme effort of will, and you didn't wake up until touchdown at the Gatwick Annex. Smooth sailing from there, or near enough. There was that business with the disappearing driver, but virtue triumphed at last. <laughs> to think you left this place with nothing but a dream in your heart, a USB drive in your pocket, and a plane ticket that cost more than everything else you owned put together. Poor little orphan Adrian. Well, I suppose you were twenty by that time, but still. Walking all the way down to Quelling's Mumley for a minicab to the airport. How times do change. And they've finished the Aldergate Bypass. You came in from the west this time. It was a little after 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean when you saw the signs for Brindle on Fay. You'd never have recognized the place, not in a thousand years. You'll have to come back by daylight for another look, shocking how much it's built up. You passed half a dozen shiny office blocks and a lineup of high street shops right out of Le Premier Arrondissement. Fancy, sleepy little boff. Back in your day, the village was still mostly clustered up around Fay Water. Now it's run down the hill and slopped right over the Altergate Road. Ah, but never fear. The ancient ways are remembered yet, and carefully observed. 
one thousand girds from the bounds of the old city, and not a rod closer. The fresh erections of glass and steel end abruptly. To your left, a sweep of winter meadow. To your right, the broad majestic order makes its silent appearance, as though it had its headwaters in the cluster of hoot cafes you've left behind. Ahead, the toothy archway of the western Barbican stands astride road and river both. Beyond, above the ancient wall, rise the towers of Aldergate University. Well then, so it begins. This diarist fellow does seem a bit insufferable, though I'm not sure he deserves quite as bad as we all know he's going to get. Funny, even as I hold the pages in my hand, the man who wrote them seems like somebody else altogether, long ago and far away, once upon a time, and I remember it just well enough that it does seem like a familiar fairy tale. A pantomime playing out according to script. Perhaps if everyone shouts, Look behind you, Adrian, I'll hear you, and stop everything before it's too late. Go on, then. Can't hurt to try. And I promise you, it will be better for everybody if it works. In case it doesn't, however, Come back and celebrate the return of the prodigal bastard at thealdergatepapers.com. I shall be posting a new episode every second Sunday. Find the Aldergate Papers on Apple Podcasts as well, and spread the word, won't you? This may be my story, but I fear that it's likely to become everybody's problem. Until next time... I am and shall remain your humble servant, Adrian Ward.